Dear friends in Christ, may the Lord's Holy Spirit dwell within you now and always, and let us now go to Him and lift up prayers to Him as we prepare to hear His Word to us, we pray. Gracious God, we give thanks to You for sending us Your Holy Spirit. We thank You for Him coming at Pentecost, leading the people and leading Your disciples to proclaim the good news of Your Word, opening hearts to receive Your Gospel message. We pray that this day, that we would be proclaimers of Your Word and those who receive that Gospel message knowing your promise of salvation are true and for us. So in all things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord's holy name. Amen. Today in our Old Testament lesson, back to Genesis chapter 11, almost the beginning, we're given probably one of the worst building projects in history. We all know what an eyesore, an unfinished building is, but this is one that was never finished. And we can relate to building projects, can't we? We've had quite a few around here in the last few years. Various additions, various changes that we've made. So we know that building projects, part of a building project, to bring it to completion is to have order, to have direction, to have a plan. Now if you don't have a plan, if you have misdirection and disorder, nothing happens, much like in Babel. The tower could not be finished because, well, no one could get along. Imagine a project here, a building project here. Imagine any group project you've ever been involved in. What happens when there is discontinuity, when people don't get along? It makes it hard to do things. Whether you're on a team that is bringing food to, to the poor and you can't decide where to go, or whether you're uh, preparing breakfast for, for the ladies on Mother's Day, and, well, we got along pretty good, so, but you can imagine what it would be like, the chaos, if we couldn't get along, if we couldn't follow directions. And that's exactly what happened with the people in that plain of Shinar. As they built the Tower of Babel, they were not able to follow directions. They were not able to follow God's word. God had given them a very simple command. Be fruitful, multiply, spread out throughout the whole earth, and propagate it, fill it up. But they were comfortable. They were happy to stay put. If we build a tower here, We'll be safe. We'll get along well. We can defend each other. Not to mention that land of Shinar. Pretty good ground to grow crops on as well. But that was not God's command. They didn't want to follow direction. They didn't want to hear God's order. They wanted things to be simple. And so in their pride, they built this tower. They built this tower not just as a building project, but as an affront to God. Basically saying to God, you might tell us to go, but we're staying. And we're going to take it to you toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Notice they wanted to build it right into heavens, the heavens, to stand face-to-face -face against God. Now, while I don't think any of you are brazen enough to build a tower, how many of us know that same spirit of pride? How many of us live each day with that pride? And I'm not talking about you going around and bragging about your new accomplishment. I'm not talking about patting on yourself on the back, but I'm talking about that pride that seems to live in each of our hearts each and every day. I'm talking about the pride that we make jokes about. The pride of the, of the man who's driving his car, his wife is trying to give him directions, and he gets lost, and even then he doesn't want direction. I'm talking about the jokes that are made about the man who's trying to build his cabinet or his desk, and when there's three parts left over after he didn't follow the directions, well, that's okay. But in seriousness... That pride is not just for men or just for women. But that pride shows up in several places in our life. How many of you have been told by a doctor to slow down? Not to do as much as you used to do. Not to get involved in the things you used to do. And you push yourself. And you push yourself despite the doctor's warnings. And you're laid up for a week after that. How many of you refuse the help of another? That's that pride. I can do it. I can do it on my own. I don't need someone else's help. It's easy, isn't it? How many of us, we have that pride that we know that we need to take things off our schedule. We know we need to find more time for God and for family, for the things that are most important. But we have ourselves convinced that if we don't do it, it won't get done, or at least it won't get done right. How many of us have the pride that lives in us that says, I have to have some part in my salvation. There has to be something I must do. 
No, pride is something that is a very real part of our lives. And even if I didn't mention something that you struggle with, you know how often pride shows up in your own life. You know how, the, how pride has given you trouble. How it's caused you pain and problems. Because pride, it leads us to trust ourselves instead of trusting God. Pride leads us to trust ourselves instead of seeking the help and support of others. Pride leads us to focus on ourselves instead of focusing above. Now we might make excuses for our pride. We might may say things like, well, it's not my fault. I was born this way. I can't help it. This is just who I am. Even we as Christians, we have this down. We talk about our pride and we say, well, we're Christian people. And so we live by grace. And so we can live how we want to live. Oh, those laws, oh, those, those laws, those are for the Old Testament people. They're 2,000 years old. We live in grace now. Maybe you guys don't say that, but how often is it in our hearts that we kind of just, we think we know best. We think we know what is better than God knows. And while we may not build a tower literally, we certainly have assembled a many towers to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, to question Him to question his design, to question his plans. Much like those people on the plain of Shinar, as they prepared to build that tower, as they built that tower. Maybe they didn't start out with saying to our, themselves, well, we're going to just push God to his limits. We're going to see if he really meant what he said. But where they ended up was far away from God's command. Our pride in our own hearts may not start out saying, we don't need God. We don't need his commands in our lives, but how fast it does push us away from Him. How fast it does become a wall between us and Him. How fast it becomes a division between us and others. And that pride, that pride is something we are very comfortable with. And so it's not something we like to look at. It's not something we like to face. Because pride, it means that when we look at our pride, it means we have to admit that we're wrong sometimes. It means that we have to strip away our excuses, those excuses that we've made. When we look at our pride, we realize we are not perfect. Those people, as they assembled the Tower of Babel, they were called children of men, sons and daughters of men. And Right before that, in Genesis chapter 6, when, they, when it referred to the children of men, it talked about sin in their hearts. Now as God responded to that sin in their hearts, though, He actually responded in grace. We might look at those divisions that He put in, that changing and confusion of the language, actually literally what Babel means is confusion. And we might say, well, that was God's judgment. But in fact, that is God's grace. That is God's grace, the confusion of the language. And I don't know if we always look at it that way. But when we look at the confusion of the language, God, because they in their prideful hearts were not willing to do what He commanded, He forced the issue, if you will. He didn't allow them to continue to down that road of sin. And even more than that, think about what that did with those many la languages, with those many nations that formed. God allowed His message to spread throughout the earth. As we see on Pentecost, the disciples being able to share it in every language. A gospel message that is not bound by one language or bound by one race, but it is meant for every race and every tribe and every tongue. Oh, but sometimes our pride certainly sneaks in again, doesn't it? Well, that old pride, it's so easy to fall back on. On Pentecost, we see that joyful giving of the Spirit, that joyful giving for every person. But how many of us, how many of us say to ourselves, well, I'm not going to share the gospel because they don't speak the language I speak. I'm not going to share the gospel because they aren't the same skin color I am. Now, I don't think any of you are racist. I'm not going to call you racist. But how often is racism, that veiled racism there, where we say, until they speak like I do or until they look like I do, I am not going to spread that message. We're going to be waiting a while. 
We're going to be waiting a long time if we wait until everyone looks like we do, everyone talks like we do, everyone smells like we do, everyone acts like we do. In fact, we might be waiting until eternity. Because God did create each of us uniquely and wonderfully. God did create each of you different than the person sitting next to you. Look around for just a minute. Look at the people that are in the same pew as you in this church. The people who are in your family. Not one of you looks exactly the same. God made you unique. God made you special. God made each of these nations different. And he has given us that command to proclaim that good news. But so often our pride gets in the way. So often our pride demands that someone else be like us. As if we are perfect. As if the way we look, the way we talk, the way we act is perfect. Many of you know I'm not perfect. I've been accused more than once that I speak with a Midwestern accent. But that being said, you still understand And you still know how important it is to proclaim that good news. And with that pride in the way, it sure is hard. And that's why we do have to face that pride. That is why we have to confront that pride as painful as it may be. But and that is why we have to confront it and be humbled. Because then when we are humbled, we can understand what it means to be the children of God. When we are humbled, we can understand what it means to need God. When we talk about dependencies in our life, and oftentimes we do know people with dependencies, whether it be drug, alcohol, sex, pornography, whether it be power or greed, people have these dependencies. And most of these dependencies, let me take that back, all of these dependencies are bad things. Because someone who has a dependency like that must rely on that chemical, that feeling. But we are dependent on God. We must be dependent on Him. And that is a humbling realization. It is a humbling realization that we are not able to save ourselves. We are not able to do anything. We are worthless. We are hopeless. And God replaces that with true worth and true hope. But not found in us, but found in His Son. When the disciples proclaimed that message on Pentecost, they were doing more than just the first evangelism trip. trip, The first evangelism trip. They were out there showing the people of God that they were worth it. They were out there proclaiming that good news reassuring them that all was not lost, but that victory had been won by Christ. They were not making excuses. They were not saying to themselves, boy, we better sit back and hope for the best. They weren't bound up in their pride, but they said, Lord, use me. Use me how you will. When we are humbled before the Lord, when we put aside our sinful pride, then we will say the same, Lord, use me. Use me as you will. Use me as empty and as unfit as I am. Use me to smite my excuses. Use me to spite my age. Use me to spite my, the language I speak. Use me, Lord. Use me to proclaim that good news. Use me. Humble me. It truly is humbling to be a child of God. But in that humbling, it does build that relationship. In that humbling, it does allow us to see that need for our Savior. But it also, that humbling allows us to build those relationships with others. How often does our pride get in the way of our relationship with our family members, with our friends, with our brothers, with our sisters? when we are humbled before God, when we are humbled before one another, we realize what a need we have to take this journey not alone, but with God. We realize how much we need those who God has placed in our lives. We realize that we can't do it on our own. 
that we were never meant to do it on our own. We realize that we, that we need the help of others and that sometimes God uses us to support others. We realize, no matter what our age, that God is still working. But you know where I see the worst difficulties with pride? is when it comes to forgiveness. How many of you have failed to forgive someone else because of your pride? That person has hurt you. That person has offended you. That person has done something. And it's unforgivable. The longer you wrestle with that, the longer you hold on to that, the harder it becomes, the more pride takes hold, and the more you say, you justify yourself. You make those same excuses. Well, I can't change because they won't change. I can't forgive them because they don't mean that. I can't forgive them because they don't deserve it. How often has pride destroyed a relationship between you and someone you love? It is only in that humility that we can repair those relationships. Not every person we forgive deserves our forgiveness. Not every person we forgive will ask for our forgiveness. Not every person who needs our forgiveness will we want to forgive. And that is why we do rely on the, the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why we do rely on Him to humble us, to lead us, so that in the midst of our humility, we might say those words, those words that God spoke to us, I forgive you. Our Savior, He humbled Himself. He humbled Himself and was humiliated in a way we could never completely understand. He was stripped and He was beaten. He was mocked and He was spat upon. He was hung on the tree like a common criminal, truly humiliated so that we might be glorified, so that we might know that hope, so that we might in our humility know the power of grace. That is the power that we boast. That is the power that Paul encouraged us to boast. Boast not in yourself, but boast in the Lord. When we boast, may we bring honor and glory to our God who is, who is the one who has defeated death, who has defeated the devil, who was humbled, but now is glorified. Amen. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we are people who are sinners. We are people who are full of pride, believing that we can do it on our own. We are people who turn our back on You time and time again, and we are people who are undeserving of Your rich grace and Your mercy. And yet You still pour it out upon us. And yet each day Your Holy Spirit comes and leads us to seek that forgiveness. And in that forgiveness, we know Your mercy. We know Your grace, for it is truly undeserved. It is truly humbling to know what You have done for us. But may we hold to that. And may we ever trust that as you have been humbled and glorified, that we, true, that we too will die. We too will suffer in this world. But one day, we too will be glorified with you as you raise all people from the grave. May your Spirit dwell with us now. May He lead us. May He guide us. May He direct us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.